Hello, my name is Gary Friedman, and welcome to the Friedman Archives blog. Today I want to talk about six underappreciated features of the Sony Alpha 7 IV. These are items that didn't necessarily make all the big splashy headlines if you've been doing your research online about how good the camera is, and it really is good. You may have missed all of these because people didn't cover them. I know about them because about six months ago, I came out with a best-selling book on the camera, the Friedman Archives Guide to the Sony a7 IV. It's about 640 pages of technical goodness. And also, to celebrate, <clears throat> recently the Spanish version has come out too. So, all markets can appreciate it. So let's get right down to it. In no particular order. There's a new metering mode for most of the new Sony cameras. It's called Highlight. Not too many people know what it does. I'm going to give you a quick demonstration. To change the metering modes, you can go to hit the function button, and if you haven't changed your function button layout, you'll see the icon in the upper right hand row. This is the metering mode. You've got several different, you know what, I'm going to make this a little bit easier to see. I'm going to set the exposure compensation to something dark, so you can see the legend a little bit better. Metering mode, there we go, and you've got five different items, multi, center, spot, and you got two versions of spot, large and standard. Entire screen average and highlight. Multi-segment metering is the camera's default. It does the best job in the greatest variety of scenarios. I'm going to just use this flashlight here to give you a demonstration of how it makes its decisions. Multi-segment metering examines every single aspect of every single pixel pretty much. And it has a built-in database regarding difficult lighting and how to correct for it. It does a great job. Now that demonstration isn't going to tell you much unless I compare it with something else, like center-weighted metering. This is what Nikon did in the 1950s. Center-weighted metering takes the center and gives it more emphasis for metering calculation than anything outside the center. Notice as I go from the corner to the center, it will gradually get darker and darker until, you know, so things in the center get weighed more. Now compare this with spot metering. Spot metering, and you got two different sizes here. You got standard and large. Let's just go with standard for right now. And you probably can't see it, so I'm going to point the camera to the ceiling. See that circle there? When the camera calculates its exposure, it will only pay attention to what's in the center and completely ignore everything outside the center to it. It completely ignores everything outside that circle. But everything inside, that's all it pays attention to. And you can see it's like an all or nothing thing. It's a very, very hard edge. And you've got two different sizes for this. Standard and large. There's the large circle. And the standard circle is a whole lot smaller. When do you use which one? Well depends on your subject, it depends on the environment. A lot of these things, the answer is that it depends. Entire screen average takes you back to Nikon's in the 1950s. It'll average everything together. Now this response will look strikingly similar to what you saw with multi-segment metering mode. So this isn't the best demonstration for the difference. However, I can tell you that in the real world, unless you've got the specialty metering modes going, Multi-segment metering makes the best choices under a wider set of normal circumstances. The only time you want to use these other metering modes is in case your lighting is ridiculously difficult and you want to be able to nail it right away. Last one. It's called highlight. What does that do? Highlight will look at every point throughout the entire frame. Find the brightest part and expose for that. So your brightest part will appear as 18% gray. Now this is extremely valuable if you're shooting a stage play or opera or any place where the performer is lit by a spotlight and the background is relatively dark. In the past, I would switch to spot metering mode and then lock the exposure using spot metering mode and then not change it until the lighting changed. But here, skips a step. You don't even need that. It's a good feature. Next are some shortcuts for traversing the menus. 
when you're in the menu, you've got three levels of structure here. You've got your left-hand column, which is every major category. You've got your star, you've got your camera, you've got your plus minus, which is exposure and color. Uh, you've got autofocus, you've got playback menu. You can traverse these either by hitting the function button in the back or by rotating the front control dial where your index finger usually falls. You can also traverse the second column. You can see it here, one, two, three, four, five, using the rear control dial. And of course, you can do up and down to select all of the individual menu items within that category. Number three, the Sony a7 IV is the first Sony camera that allows you to give the smooth skin effect when shooting video. Now, the smooth skin effect is kind of controversial, so most of the websites probably didn't cover it. But basically, whenever you have somebody with a lot of acne, you can set up the smooth skin function and it'll try to gloss it over. It's like uh, too much processing. You can access it on the menu by going to the, uh, the exposure slash color menu and then down to the color slash tone menu, and it's the last item on the right-hand side, the soft skin effect. When you turn it on, you have your choice of strengths. Try to avoid high. It's a little over-aggressive. You got mid and you got low. But this is the first camera ever that lets you do this not only in stills but in video, and here's a quick sample of that. In my seminars, I always tell people to avoid too much post-processing because it calls too much attention to itself. Whenever you're doing beauty shots and trying to smooth the skin to make the person look younger, you can easily overdo it. The highest setting of this easily overdoes it, so try to use lower or medium. Number four is only available in cameras that ship in North America and are set to the English language. It's called talking menus. No, it's not. It's called the screen reader function. Here's what it is. I'm probably in that category of people who doesn't appreciate it too much. Under menu, tools, or toolbox, accessibility, screen reader. Now I'm going to move the camera so it's close to my microphone so you can hear what I'm hearing. This will essentially read the screen to you in case you're blind, in case you're a blind photographer, which doesn't really make much sense if you think about it. Let's turn it on. Menu screen. Setup tab, accessibility group, screen reader, screen reader, on, button, delete button display guide, menu button back. So it's reading to you every single icon on the screen. Let me go back one. Setup tab, accessibility group, screen reader, right key, button, rear dial page change, delete button display guide, menu button close. Helpful, isn't it? Set now you can tab, also change the speed. Set up tab, speed, slow right, one. Right now it's set up to slow. Radio button, fast, 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 radio button, delete button, display guide, button back. Wait, I can go faster. Fast forward, unselected, radio button, delete button, display guide, button back. So in my book, I recommend play with the feature for a few minutes, and then when you're done, turn it off and staple it there. Number five is another feature, which I don't think is too useful. However, I see this as a prelude to a future feature. And uh, let me show you what it is first and let me tell you what I think it's gonna morph into in future generations. This is a function called focus map and you can reach it by going to AMFF, AMF, A, hello, AFMF, focus assistant, focus map. Oh, you don't find it here because the camera has to be in movie mode in order for this to appear in the menus. So let me go switch it to movie mode here. Menus. Focus map. First item in the menu. Turn it on. So here's what it's doing right now. It's going to show you different colors of the areas which are behind the focus point and in front of the focus point. Anything behind the current focus point is going to be blue. Anything in front of the current focus point is going to be red. Uh, I'm going to set up a, a quick demonstration here. Uh, there's that flashlight, and here's my book. There we go. First, I'm going to focus on the flashlight. Now, if... There. With this tool, the thing that you're focused on is not going to have any color cast on it. That way you can know, yes, this is what you're focused on. I'm going to switch to the book now. There. 
I can tell the book's perfectly in focus because there's no color cast on it. And once again, things that are behind the focus point are blue. Things that are in front of the focusing point is, are red. Is this useful? Uh, jury's still out on that. I haven't found it to be useful. Nothing else. There's too much screen clutter for my eye. However, I believe this is a prelude to a feature for the future. Most modern smartphones now can take a picture and also capture a 3D depth map of the scene, which is then stored in the HEIF file, and then you can open it up in Photoshop later on and apply a graduated Gaussian blur to that image to simulate an f2.8 telephoto lens. It's a handy thing. Why can't the big cameras do that? Well, they can, especially with the Sonys. With these mirrorless cameras, almost every single pixel is its own focusing point. And whenever it decides on what to focus on, it knows what the distance is for every single pixel without having to hunt or anything. It just knows how far things are away. So within a, a microsecond or so, the camera can read out every single focus point throughout the sensor, build the depth map, and then store it in the HEIF file, just like a smartphone does, except smartphones do it a different way. Anyway, I predict that this will be refined in the future, and then it'll turn into a depth map, mark my words. Uh, there's one more feature, which is handy if you're shooting video, but not too handy if you're doing anything else. It's called a virtual zoom. The great thing about it is you can zoom in, you can throw away pixels, but whenever you're shooting HD or 4K video with your camera, you are already throwing away pixels. So do throw away a different set of pixels when you do a virtual zoom. When I'm in, there we go. On this camera, I have reassigned the left and the right, I call them the arrow buttons. It's around the, uh, the wheel. I reassign them to the following. Oh, let me turn the focus map off, shall we? Turn that off. Let me show you my button assignments. Tools. Operation Customize, and for the custom key and dials for movie mode, that's the second one, um, my left and right buttons are here, three and four. Zoom Operation Wide and Zoom Operation Telephoto. So whenever I'm in movie mode, if I want to zoom in, all I have to do is hit one of those buttons and I get a virtual zoom. Even if my lens doesn't have a power zoom, this will do it for me. It's a poor man's power zoom lens. You can also adjust the speed at which it zooms in and out. And you can set different speeds for when you're in standby mode and when you're recording. So if you're a videographer, that's a very good thing. So those are some random features about the a7 IV. There are thousands more. And if you want to know about all the detail about them, pick up a copy of my best-selling book on the Sony Alpha 4 from the Freeprint Archives, available at a website near you. That's it. Thanks so much for watching.